Our Father, we thank you tonight. We return all the glory to you. You alone are worthy of our joy. You alone are worthy of our thanksgiving. You alone are worthy of our celebration. Because you are the reason for our living. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. Thank you, Father, because there is none like you and there can't be anyone like you. None compare to the wonder of your glory. We give you praise tonight and always. We thank you for the privilege to be in your presence tonight. And we are depending upon you that you are going to help us. By your spirit, the heavens will be open, And the word will come with accuracy and power. To heal, to save, to deliver, to build up, to empower. Tonight, Lord, we are trusting you. Father, be thou exalted in Jesus' name. Great Holy Spirit, I ask that you will take over from the first minute to the last minute. Fill this house with your glory. Lord, we do not claim to know the Bible. The Holy Spirit is the revealer of the deep things of God. We ask tonight that more than ever before, the Holy Spirit will open the scriptures unto us. You will practically teach us. You will practically impart our life with the knowledge of the truth. In the name of Jesus, we receive equipping fitted for the last day battle. Online, on ground, let your word come with an arresting freshness, with power, with grace, with accuracy, and with understanding. Thank you, Father. Great Holy Spirit, do and say the things that only you can do and say. Glorify Jesus tonight and establish the counsels of the Father. Tonight, it is not what man wants to say, but what you want to say. What you want us to know. We open up to you tonight, trusting that you will take all the glory. Thank you, Father. Blessed, O Lord, be your holy name. In Jesus' name, I pray. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let me welcome you to the Bible study tonight. I personally count it a very rare privilege under God to assess the presence of the Father and to receive instructions from His Word. My prayer is that tonight we will be a beneficiary of the ministry of the Holy Spirit again. In the name of Jesus, it will not be head knowledge. It will be a peculiar revelation of the truth that will transform our lives to what God wants it to be. Uh, tonight, I'm going to continue in our series of studies in the book of Revelation. You know, last week, we ended our studies in verse 11 of chapter 1. Even though we are going to pick it up from that same verse 11 tonight, but my focus is going to be on Revelation chapter 1 verse 11 to 18, and verse 20. Revelation chapter 1, verse 11 to 18, and verse 20. And I want you to take note that that's a passage. All right? So, tonight, we are beginning a series with this passage. Revelation chapter 1, verse 11 to 18 and verse 20. You will notice that I omitted verse 19 for special reasons. As we read tonight, you will understand. But we pick verse 11 down to 18 and then 
verse 20. Verse 19 is a subject on its own that must be taken uh, separately. But I want you to really follow tonight. So in this passage that I have carved out, we'll be looking at a general team known as the vision of the glorified Christ. The vision of the glorified Christ. Tonight I'm going to be dealing with part one. The vision of the glorified Christ. So this long passage of chapter one, verse 11 to 18 and 20 is generally with the theme, the vision of the glorified Christ. Even though under it, I'll begin to take what I call subtopic, subtopic, subtopic as we keep our focus on different verses embedded in this passage. I believe you understand that structure because it's very important to outlay it so that you can begin to follow it in your heart. One of the very important uh, uniqueness of Bible study is if it is Bible study really, we have to take it step by step, verse by verse, not to meet in anything because there are no incident the word of God that is nothing incidental to the word of God. The word of God is deliberate. Every revelation, every statement in the Bible are deliberate statements orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. And they have a message. And for us to study the Bible and study the word of God, we've got to get what the Holy Ghost is saying from verse to verse and passage to passage. Is that okay? I, you know the story we have been coming up with, and you know John was in the island of Patmos. You remember that? And you know exactly what brought him to the island of Patmos. It was as a result of persecution. And he said it himself, that it was in the island of Patmos, a dangerous island for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. So in that island of Patmos, Jesus practically visited him to give him the revelation. Are you hearing me now? And that's what we are entering tonight. So I'm going to read from Revelation chapter 1, from verse 11 to 18 and 20. I want you to please follow me and uh, take note of some of the things I will emphasize in the course of the reading. So let's start with verse, um, let, let's start with from verse 10 for us to understand the flow. Revelation chapter 1 from verse 10. Don't forget, I'm dealing with the vision of the glorified Christ the vision of the glorified Christ. So I start from verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice. That's John talking. I had a great voice behind me as of a trumpet. What is the voice saying? Verse 11. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega of course, you know that voice is Jesus' voice. The first and the last, and what thou seest, which means he's ready to show him a revelation. Write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pagamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Verse 12, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me. That's John now. When he had a voice behind him, it is only natural for him to turn to find out where is this voice coming from. That's what happened. And he said, I'm being turned. I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Who is being referred to as the Son of Man? 
in the Bible, from your general understanding of the Bible, who is being referred to as the Son of Man? Jesus Christ. You know John was a disciple of Jesus in, during the earthly ministry of Jesus. So he knew that this is Jesus. But because he is appearing in a different form, he couldn't immediately confirm. But he knew, I have seen this before. I, have, I know this, this looks like the Lord. This looks like Jesus himself. That's why he made that statement, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and got about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his ears were white like wool. Of course, you know, this is not the normal Christ that he used to see when he was still in the world. Are you getting what I'm saying now? But you know, this is the glorified Christ. This is the vision of the glorified Christ. Not the Christ that, it is not the state he used to see Christ when Christ was ministering on the earth. All right, but this is the glorified Christ, the same Christ, but in different appearance and in different manifestation. Verse 14 His head and his ears were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Can you see? And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shining in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Now look at verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven golden, the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Amen. So let me give a general review of this passage. And then I'll go to talk about what I'm focusing on today. The whole book of Revelation focuses on the plan and the program of Jesus Christ. For his church, as well as the world, especially in the last days. What you see in the whole book of Revelation is the plan of Jesus and the program of Jesus for his church and for the world. You see, there are two categories of people in the world as far as divine estimation is concerned. There are two categories of people in the world as far as divine estimation is concerned. The first category is the church. That is the people that God is dealing with. The people that have accepted the redemptive plan of God. Those who have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. The body of Christ on the earth. That's the church. That's the first group of people that exist in divine estimation. The church. Somebody say the church. Now, the other people that are not part of the church, when I say they are not part of the church, it doesn't mean they don't go to church on Sunday. I mean, they have not accepted Jesus Christ. They have not accepted the plan of salvation. They have not come and brought, brought their life to the submission of the purpose of God. They are the world. So, in the world today, there are two groups of people in divine estimation. The church and the world. Everybody, everywhere in the world, you either belong to either of the two. You are either part of the church 
or you are part of the world. So the book of Revelation is about the plan of Jesus, the program of Jesus for the two groups. Jesus had plan and program for the church and then he has plan and program for the world in the last days. And as you read the book of Revelation, you begin to see the unveiling of the plans and programs of Jesus for the church and for the world. Since they are not the same, then the plan and programs are different. But you don't want to be part of that program for the world. You want to be part of God's plan and program for the church. Because the real people that God is actually looking up to, caring for, and really doing something for, is the church. The world has a way, uh, the world in their own, they are outside the real plan of God. They are not, it's not as if God doesn't want to do something with them, but by choice, they have walked away from the redemptive plan of God. By choice. Are you hearing me now? That's why the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, so God is not going to force anybody, whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life. But you discover that many people by choice have chosen not to believe, not because he is not available, not because the program of God does not include them. God loves the whole world. But God is not going to force the whole world to accept him and to believe in his, in his program, to believe Jesus. So the people that chose never to believe, they are going to face their own consequence, especially in these last days. So the whole book of Revelation is the unveiling of the plan and programs of Jesus, both for his church and for the world. Did you get that now? That's the first truth I want you to know. Number two, the book of Revelation revealed the eternal identity of Jesus Christ and his appearance in his glorified form. That's one thing unique about the book of Revelation. It reveals the eternal identity of Jesus Christ. Right from the first chapter, you will see the eternal identity of Jesus Christ. In the passage I've read, you saw when Jesus was saying, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last. That is an eternal identity. In fact, specifically in this passage, he told John that I am he that liveth and I'm dead and I am living again, never to die again. Now, look at verse 18. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive for how long? Forevermore. You see the eternal identity of Jesus. That is one unique manifestation or, or revelation in the book of Revelation. The eternal identity of Jesus Christ. The fact that he was, he is, and he is to come. He never died. He was alive. He was dead. He's alive forevermore. That's an eternal identity. That explains what Jesus was telling the Jews in John chapter 8. When they were telling him, who do you call yourself? Are you bigger than Abraham, our father? You know, they began to express arrogance in their connection by biology to, Abra to Abraham. And they said, are you bigger? Who are you? And all that. I mean, and, 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 and you know what Jesus told them? He said, even your father Abraham was happy to see my day. And they said, why are you talking blasphemy? You are not up to 50 years and you are claimed to have seen Abraham. And Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Now, they didn't understand. Because the gospel does not focus on the eternal identity of Jesus. The gospel, when I say the gospel, 
I'm talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those four books didn't focus on the eternal identity of Jesus. They focused on the redemption plan of Jesus. The redemption plan of God that Jesus came to fulfill. He was born in a manger. You see, his humanity. Much of the gospel was about his humanity and his mission. The heart. Are you following me now? Much of the gospel focuses on the humanity of Jesus. He came here as the son of man to die for us and redeem us back to God. He was hungry like any other human being. He felt asleep like every other human being. You remember when he was asleep in the, in the boat. You remember when he was hungry and he told his disciples to go and get some food for him. You know, those are the emotions of humanity. He had such emotion. So, most of the gospel is focusing on the ministry of Jesus, the life of Jesus on the earth. Are you following what I'm saying now? So, they could say, okay, this is his mother, and then this is the earthly father, and then his brothers and sisters are there. You remember when he got to Nazareth in Mark chapter 6, that they, they didn't take him serious. They said, who is this one? Uh, uh, is this not the carpenter? Because customarily, the first son in Jewish family takes up the trade of his father. And Joseph was agreed to be his earthly father. Joseph was a carpenter. That was why they saw Jesus also as a what? As a carpenter. They say, is this not the carpenter? W where did he get all the teaching he's talking about? His brothers are all here. They could trace the humanity of Jesus. They could trace the human origin of Jesus. That was why when he resurrected, they never believed. They, they never believed. In fact, they had to bribe the soldiers to say that he didn't rise up. Because nobody believed he could rise up. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? So all they know about, about Jesus in the gospel is his life, his ministry, and all that. But the book of Revelation revealed to us his eternal identity and his appearance in the glorified form. There are two appearances of Jesus that must characterize our Christianity. His appearance in the lowly form. His appearance in the lowly form. The Bible said in Philippians chapter 2, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who though he was God, did not count it as robbery to be equal with God, but took on the form of a servant. That is the lowly form. Somebody say lowly form. So in the gospel, you see the appearance of Jesus in the lowly form. But that's not all there is to know about Christ. The book of Revelation balances it up. By giving us the appearance of Jesus in the glorified form. In the glorified form. There is a Jesus in the lowly form. In the, that's the Savior that came to save. The Savior that came to deliver. And then there is the Lord. In the glorified form. The King that came to judge the heart. So I want you to understand what the book reveals. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? So for a balanced Christianity, you must have a revelation of the appearance of Jesus in the lowly form. What does it imply in our Christian life? And a revelation of the appearance of Jesus in the glorified form. What does it imply in our Christianity? There are some Christians, the only thing they know is the revelation of Jesus in the lowly form. And uh, all about suffering, all about poverty, all about, you know, serving, all about gentility, all about just being at the receiving end. And that's why the, their Christianity will not be balanced. Because that is not all there is to know about Jesus. But there are some also that the only thing they know about Jesus is his appearance in the glorified form. So they are very flamboyant. They look royal. I mean, and they look like these people, their own is too much. But 
for balanced Christianity. We need the two. Jesus, in the lowly form, he came to execute the plan of God for redemption of mankind. And Jesus, in the glorified form, he came to judge the whole world as king. So the book of Revelation gave us a balance. That's why it is a book that must be studied. So that your balance, your understanding of Christ will be balanced. And number three, if you look at the book of Revelation, it variously and clearly reveals Jesus Christ as the exalted and risen Lord who will judge the whole world. The book of Revelation variously and clearly reveals Jesus Christ as the exalted and risen Lord who will judge the whole world. So in the gospel, you see a servant that came to save the whole world. In the book of Revelation, you see a risen Lord, an exalted king who will judge the whole world. If his salvation covers the whole world, his judgment will also cover the whole world. If he could save the whole world by the shedding of his blood, he is qualified to judge the whole world. Did you get that now? Did you get that now? If he could save the whole world by his death and resurrection, then he is qualified to judge the whole world. So the book reveals Jesus Christ as the exalted and the risen Lord who will judge the whole world. Now let me focus on the passage we have read tonight. Let's start from verse, um, from verse uh, 10. Let's start from verse 10. Now I was in the spirit on the last day and had behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Now, that's clear, isn't it? I had behind me a great voice. So, the voice of the Lord that came to John like a trumpet is a reminder of the mode of communication of God with the children of Israel. On Mount Sinai. The voice of the Lord that came like a trumpet to John in the book of Revelation, it's a reminder. Somebody say a reminder of God's mode of communication to the children of Israel in Mount Sinai when he gave them his commandments. The plan of God was to talk directly to the children of Israel. As a father speaketh with his son. That's the original plan of God. And God told Moses to gather the children of Israel around the Mount Sinai. That he will speak to them directly. Beloved, God never planned that there would be a, a, an intermediary between him and the children of Israel. Is that okay? God never planned that there would be an intermediary. It is not the plan of God that somebody we hear his instruction for his people. That's not the plan of God. The plan of God is that he will talk to his people directly. He will, his people, he will give his people instruction directly. Now, how many of you know that as your pastor now, if you talk to me directly, you are going to have a better relationship with me than depending on some, the, talking to me through somebody. Did you get what I'm saying now? Now, assuming that it's an intermediary between us now, that anything you want to tell me, you, you, you cannot assess me. You have to go through an intermediary. Now, you will still reach me, but we won't have a strong relationship. If I want to have a strong relationship with you, then I must be able to talk to you directly without intermediary. That is the original plan of God, that he will talk to his people. Because one of the things that facilitates effective relationship is communication. Communi communication. Communication fosters relationship. It builds relationship. When you, when you have access to communicate, 
you know the person more deeply than if somebody is in the middle of you and that person. So the plan of God is that I would to my people, I would speak to them directly without any intermediary. That was why God called, God told Moses, call all the people together. I want to give, give them law. When they get to Mount Sinai and they saw God and they heard the voice of God sounding like trumpet, they were the ones that were afraid. The whole mountain was filled with smoke. They were afraid. In fact, they told Moses, look, we can't tolerate his voice. I want to pray for you that you will develop the maturity to tolerate the voice of God. Your Christianity will not be based upon an intermediary. You will have a direct connection with your father. Because any other plan is an aberration. God wants to speak to you directly. That's why he gave us the Bible. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit. He wants to speak to you directly. Because it is in speaking to you directly that you can know you well. And you can know him well. Especially you will know him well when you hear his voice. But the children of Israel couldn't go. They couldn't tolerate. Fear gripped them. They said, ah, we will die. Yo. If we continue to hear this voice, this voice that is sounding like trumpet, wow, we will die. Yo. Moses, please, hear for us. That's a second-rated relationship. And unfortunately, that is the kind of relationship that most believers are developing with God today. A second-rated relationship. Hear for us whatever he has to say. Let him tell you and you will come and tell us. But that's not the plan of God. Now let, let me show you that place. Open your Bible to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. I read from verse 16 to 19. I want every one of us to open our Bible and let's read uh, together. Exodus chapter 19, I read from verse 16. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mound and the voice of the what? Of the trumpet. Now, does it look like the voice of, the, like, like of a trumpet that John had behind him in Revelation chapter 1? The same God talking here. The vo and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud. So that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke. Because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as, his, as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mount quaked greatly. Look at verse 19 again. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. Now look at chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. I read from verse 18 to 20. Exodus chapter 20 from verse 18 to 20. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the, the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar. They removed mean they, they ran away. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they moved back. They couldn't, con they couldn't tolerate that atmosphere. They moved back and stood afar off. Verse 19. And here, this is where they actually demoted themselves. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. I pray this will not be your portion. May you not live a life that God can't speak to you. You get what I'm saying? This is not the plan of God. This is their own design. Because they couldn't tolerate the presence of God. They couldn't tolerate the glory of God. 
they were afraid they thought they would die. And Moses said unto the people, verse 20, Fear not, for God is come to prove you. He has not come to kill you. He has only come to test you. He has only come to prove you. And that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. Now, God, when, when John had the voice of Jesus behind him like that of a trumpet, he was a reminder of God's mode of communication with the children of Israel on Mount Sinai. Are you hearing me now? It was a reminder. It was a reminder. And let me tell you, when the day of resurrection comes, the great day of resurrection, that day will be announced with the sound of trumpet. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When the great day of resurrection comes, that day will be announced by the voice of a trumpet. First Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, let's read verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the what? For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised. Now, if you just oppose these three different passages together, do you know it is also allowed to say that the trumpet that shall sound in the day of resurrection is actually the voice of Jesus? How many of you agree with that? Because in Revelation chapter 1 from verse 10, John had the voice like a trumpet. And I told you, that was a reminder of God's mode of communication with his people on Mount Sinai. Although they, they, delete, they demoted themselves to a second-rate uh, person with God, God wanted to speak to them directly. Are you hearing me now? And I told you, so that you know that it's not in the island of Patmos that that came as a new development. It's been God's mode of communication. And then even in the great day of resurrection, the last day, we are still expecting it. You hear when we say the trumpet shall sound. I agree that it is the voice of Jesus like of, as of a trumpet. Just like the one that John had behind him. Just like the one that the children of Israel could no longer tolerate, especially when it became louder and louder. Are you hearing me now? So you see this voice like a trumpet is very central to God communicating with his people. Are you hearing me now? It's key. And it's the same thing that repeated itself in the book of Revelation. And let me tell you, beloved, the voice that John had actually awakened him to the sacredness of the vision of the glorified Christ. When he had that voice, he knew he had never had that kind of voice before. So something peculiar is about to happen. When you hear the voice you have not heard before, won't you want to turn to find out what is happening? He knew something is about to happen. And what was about to happen was that the vision of the glorified Christ was about to be unveiled to him. So the voice that he had, like a trumpet, was to awaken his consciousness to the solemnity of that vision. To the uniqueness of this vision. To the sacredness of this vision. To call his attention. So that he could give maximum attention. That was why Jesus said in verse 11. What thou see? What? Write it down. Write it down in a book. And send it out. 
So your concentration must be super. That voice was to awaken him to the uniqueness of the vision that he was about to see. Beloved, according to this book of Revelation, John saw that Jesus Christ was a very different person from whom he had previously seen in the flesh while he was on the earth. When Jesus was on the earth, John was very familiar with Jesus. He was very close to him. In fact, when the other disciples wanted to tell Jesus something, they beckoned to John to help them communicate. So John knew Jesus, and the appearance of Jesus was not terrifying. But in the book of Revelation, John saw another dimension of the appearance of Jesus. This time around, different from what he used to see. When you begin to get more matured in the spirit, your revelation of Jesus becomes deepened. I am praying that you will not be a lightweight person. You will have a deeper understanding, a deeper revelation of the glorified Christ in the name of Jesus. That's one of the reasons why you should pursue maturity. Because the more mature you become in the things of God, the more secret God wants to unveil to you. The Bible said the secret of the Lord is not in the market. It's not available to everybody. God has secrets. But the secret of the Lord is with them that what? That fear him. The closer you are to God, the deeper the revelation you can access. So, this time around, what John saw of the appearance of Jesus was different from what he used to see and what he used to know when Jesus was on the earth. So, John could not withstand it. John saw the awesome portrait of the glorified Christ. He saw the awesome portrait of the glorified Christ. And if you follow me, as I read it, you will see the description. Look at the portrait. Verse 12. Revelation chapter 1 verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that came that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Look at the description now. One like unto the Son of Man. Clothed with a garment down to the foot. And got about the paps with a golden girdle. Verse 14. His head and his ears are white like wool. Now that's a serious vision. That's a unique vision. As white as snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass. As if they burn in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Wow. Somebody say, Wow. So John saw the portrait of the glorified Christ. So he couldn't withstand it. He couldn't withstand the sight. The sight has a profound impact upon him. Look at verse 17. Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. And when I saw him, what did I do? I jumped up. I jumped at him. Is that what you find in your Bible? What did you find in your Bible? I fell at his feet as what? As dead. The sight was frightening. The glorified Christ appeared in his full authority, in his royal power. It was frightening. So, he fell down. And you know, he said, he lays hand upon me. Jesus laid us upon him. Let me complete verse 17. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Beloved, what I'm focusing on tonight is, write this down, Jesus Christ 
in the midst of his church. This is my focus for tonight. The vision of the glorified Christ is a series. But the first part of it tonight is focusing on Jesus Christ in the midst of his church. And I'm going to limit myself to Revelation chapter 1, verses 12, 13, and 20. Verse 12, 13, and 20. I'm taking the whole of verse 12, a little part of verse 13, and the whole of verse 20. Next week, we'll continue. Are you following me now? So the first part of the vision of the glorified Christ is Jesus Christ in the midst of his church. Let's read Revelation chapter 1, verse 12, verse 13, and uh, verse 20. But I will first read verse 12, and I will get to read verse 20. Because verse 20 explains verse 12. There are some things mentioned in verse 12 that verse 20 gave us the meaning, the interpretation. Look at verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me and being torn. What did he say he saw? I saw what? Seven golden candlesticks. I want you to underline that in your Bible. Seven golden candlesticks. Somebody says seven golden candlesticks. Now, ordinarily, when you read the book of Revelation and you are reading seven golden candlesticks, you begin to wonder, what does it mean? Beloved, it means something. And let me tell you that in the book of Revelation, Christ revealed himself with symbols, symbols of his function. The dignity of Christ shown with judicial authority is kingly presence and power was revealed in symbolic terms. All the contents of the book of Revelation including the numbers, the various numbers used in that book are symbolic. Statements on Christ are symbolic. That is why a proper interpretation of the book of Revelation is required for understanding. In verse 12, we saw seven, somebody says seven, golden candlestick. Seven has its own symbol. Golden has its own symbolic interpretation. And the candlestick has its own symbolic interpretation. Now look at verse 20. What is the meaning of that candlestick? Verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars. Now we're not going to talk about the seven stars today. Alright? We'll talk about that sometimes to come. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden what? Candlestick. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now, this is the one we are talking about today. And the seven candlestick which thou saw it, are the what? The seven churches. So the candlestick is not just an artistic impression. It is symbolic. Golden candlestick is the seven churches. So the candlestick is the church. Are you following me now? Now look at verse 13. Revelation chapter 1 verse 13. And in the midst of the seven candlestick, in the midst, in where? Where? It's not talking of in the front. It's not talking of at the back. It's talking of in the midst, which means center. Center is the place of influence. Center is a place of control. Center is a place of authority. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. So, you now see why I said we are looking at Jesus Christ in the midst of his church. Did you see that now? 
But if you just read it like that, you wouldn't, without decoding the different symbols, you won't understand the passage. Jesus Christ, in the midst of his church, he is like on the Son of Man. And he is in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And the seven golden candlesticks represent the churches. So Jesus is in the center of his church. Beloved, that's the rightful place that Jesus always wants to occupy. He wants to be in the center of his church. It's a place of control. It's a place of influence. It's a place of authority. He's the head of the church. He wants to be at the center of his church. Just like your heart is the center of your life. Jesus wants to be the center. That the church cannot exist without his presence. Any so-called church without the presence of Jesus is an illegitimate gathering. Jesus wants to be at the center of his church. Are you with me now? That's when the church can be church. That's when we, the signs of God can appear. That's when the purpose of God can be established. Jesus wants to be at the center of his church. You are part of that church. Jesus wants to be at the center of your life. In the midst of your plan. In the midst of your pursuit. In the midst of your goal. In the midst of your dream. He wants to authorize it. He wants to sanction it. It's a place of control. It's a place of authority. There are five things I want to share with you. Number one. The assembly of born again Christian. In the sight of God. Is like a candlestick. That is supposed to do two things. The assembly of born again Christian. In the sight of God, in the spirit, is like a candlestick that should show forth the light of the love of God and the light of the word of God. That's the first truth that we can get out of verse 12 and verse 13 of Revelation chapter 1. The assembly of born again Christian. Take note, I didn't say nominal Christian. The reason why the so-called church of today is very weak is that the people gathering together calling themselves church are not born again. We have too many people today in church that are not born again. When somebody is not born again, when people gather together and they are not born again, that's not the gathering of the church. Jesus can never be in their midst. Biblically, salvation is your is what qualifies you for membership of church. Hello, somebody? That is not how it is today. And it is unfortunate. All kinds of people come to church and they say, I'm a member of that church. I'm a member of that church. I'm a member of the church. I'm a member of the church. Biblically, nobody qualifies to be referred to as a member of the church if he's not born again. Because the church is supposed to be an assembly of born again Christians. Why? Because in the spirit, the church of God is like a candlestick to do two things to show forth the light of the love of God and the light of the word of God. Anything outside that is not church. So most of the places, most of what we call church today is not church. Are you following what I'm saying now? Today now nice church is just have a place and then people gather and then we start to sing and then we start to clap. 
then that's church. Biblically, that's not church. Anybody can gather. People can come together for political meeting. People can come together for different reasons. But there is no church except it is an assembly of born again Christians. Is somebody hearing me now? So if you are not born again, you are not part of the church. You may have your name in the register of Abundant Grace Assembly. But your name is not in the register of Christ Church. So your life cannot manifest the light of God. The light of the word of God. And the light of the love of God. Because that's what the church should do. Beloved, in the spirit, as far as the church is concerned, God is not looking at a cathedral. We thank God, 100,000 seater cathedral, we thank God. 500,000 auditorium, capacity auditorium, we thank God. But that's not church. In the spirit, God is not looking at the cathedral. In the spirit, God is looking at a candlestick. Somebody say a candlestick. That's what the church appears in the sight of God in the spirit. Now, if the whole of this Akure is a building required, referred to as church, and everybody can say, wow, wow, we even have to travel inside the same auditorium. This is big. This is huge. That's not how it appears in the spirit in the sight of God. Did you hear me now? All those ones are human arrangement for us to find a place to stay. That's all. But as far as God is concerned, the church is a candlestick. And what is it supposed to do? To show forth the light of the love of God and the light of the word of God. Brethren, the church is a candlestick in a locality. The church is a candlestick in the world. For, for us here, this church is a candlestick in this locality. What are we here to do? We are not here to compete with anybody. We are not here to do our personal business. As long as we remain the church of God, we are a candlestick in this locality to show forth the light of the love of God and the light of the word of God. Did you hear me? Look up everybody. Every other business we do that is not showing forth the light of the love of God and the light of the word of God disqualifies us as a church in the sight of God. Did you hear me now? Every other thing we do may appear noble, may appear wonderful, but if it does not show forth the light of the love of God and the light of the word of God, we are no longer the church of Christ. We are here in this locality not to impress anybody, not to please anybody, but to represent God in this locality. We are God's candlestick in this locality to show forth the light of the love of God and the light of the word of God. We don't have any other business outside that. Every program must be to fulfill that. Every gathering must be to fulfill that. Every prayer meeting must be to fulfill that. When purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. The, the generation we are in are abusing the church today, using it for what is not in the purpose of God. Using the church for personal business. Using the church for different things. That's why a God needs to call people and send them. Otherwise, that church does not have a candlestick in heaven. Is not recognized in heaven. 
Only God knows how many churches are registered with Corporate Affairs Commission in Abuja that have no registration with God. Since it is not showing forth the light of the love of God and the light of the word of God. Somebody say candlestick. That's the church. We are candlestick. We are candlestick. Every other thing we do outside that will invalidate us in the presence of God. That's the first truth. Number two. As light. The church does not have the light of our own. The church is to reflect the light of Christ. Did you see now? We don't have the light of our own. We have to simply reflect the light of Christ. So the church is not about personal agenda of somebody. The church is not a personal agenda of somebody. We should not exalt the founder of the church above the head of the church. We should not give recognition to the general overseer above the head of the church. When that happened, that church has lost its candlestick in the presence of the father. And unfortunately, most churches have lost their candlestick. I don't have a personal agenda. We're here to fulfill divine agenda. Because the church does not have light of our own. The church is to reflect whose light? The light of Christ. Based on this standard, you discover that most places, you don't have church. You have business going on. You have personal businesses going on. How many things are done in church today that God doesn't know anything about? If it is about God's agenda, should God not know it? Answer me. If it is about God's agenda, should anything be going on in the church that God doesn't know anything about? Praise God. The Bible said the church is the house of God. The house of God. The pillar and the ground of the truth. So the church does not have the light of our own. The church is to reflect the light of Christ. It is the light of Jesus Christ. It is the grace of God. It is the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb that change our lives as Christ's church and made us to become candlestick able to bear the light of Christ. That's why Christ has made us the light of the world. If you look at Matthew chapter 5 verse 16, the Bible says, Ye are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. So you must let your light so shine. When the Bible says your light, it means the light of Christ in you. The light of Christ in you. Say after me, we are the light of the world. Say it again, we are the light of the world. Now, when you say that statement, this is the meaning. We are the light of Christ in the world. We are the light of Christ in the world. So when you say we are the light of the world, it's not as if we have a light of our own. We are the light of the world because we are the light of Christ in the world. So we don't have a light of our own. We reflect the light of Christ. And that's why we are to shine the light of Christ before men. Did you get that now? Say after me, I have no light of my own. Say, I have no light of my own. I have the light of Christ. I am the light of Christ in the world. In the world for you may be in your school. In the world for you may be in your community. 
in the world for you may be in the civil service, in your office, in the world for you may be in your business circle, in your business circle, in the world for you may be in politics, in whatever world you belong to. You are the light of Christ in that world. How can we be in the world and the world will be full of darkness? It means we are failing as light. How can you be in your family and they don't have access to the light of the word of God? How can you be in a street and they don't have access to the light of the word of God? How can people be in your contact list on your phone? And nothing of light is coming from you to them every day. You are failing as a light. I pray that the Lord will restore us. Today you see people very proud. They say, I'm a Christian. When they are feeling form, they say religion. They write capital letter, Christianity. But they don't know the essence of Christianity. We are the light of Christ in the world. You are the light of Christ in the world. Among the tailors, among the mechanics, among the bricklayers, among the professors, among the doctors, among the lawyers, among the electricians, you are the light of Christ in that place. I want you to be able to locate yourself among the traders in the market, you are the light of Christ. To fail in that is to fail the essence of being a Christian. I'm praying that you will not fail. If we have been failing before, I see God calling you back to responsibility. Your Christianity is not in your bearing somewhere. Your Christianity is not in your bearing Dockers or Lydia or Isaac or even bearing Jesus. Your Christianity is in your capacity to show forth the light of Christ. May your candlestick not be taken out of his pores. May your light not become darkness in the name of Jesus. Number three, believers are also compared to a gold candlestick. When I was reading Revelation chapter 1 the other time, especially verse 12, I told you to take note of that seven golden candlestick. How many of you remember that time? Good. So, golden is critical. Since we know candlestick is the church, now, golden. There are different types of church. There are different. Now, the church is there. But what type of church? What type of church? Golden. Somebody say golden. Now, it could have been silver, isn't it? But they didn't put silver there. Golden is symbolic for precious, priceless. So, believers are compared to a golden material. Believers are precious material. Believers are compared to a priceless material. Because gold is the most precious metal. So, what does that mean? It means in the sight of God, the church, that is the redeemed people, are the most priceless and precious people on the earth. The church, that is the redeemed people, are the most priceless and the most precious people on the earth. So if you are looking for the most precious people on the earth, if you are born again, you are that person. Because you are part of the church. Of course, you know the church is not these blocks. Yes or no? 
Jesus is not walking in the midst of this block. Jesus is walking in the midst of human beings. Those who are born again. Those who are believers. Those who are part of, his, of him on the earth. That's why we say the body of Christ. The head of Christ is in, the, is in heaven. The body of Christ is on the earth. You get what I'm saying? You get what I'm saying? The head is where? The head of the church is where? In heaven. And Christ is that head. The body of the church. The body of Christ is where? Is here on the earth. Are you following what I'm saying now? So the head is Christ. The body of Christ is the church. You cannot separate the body from the head. If the head is precious, the body is also precious. So you are precious. I'm here to tell you tonight, the greatest thing that can happen to you is to become born again. It makes you most important personality. I remember I told you sometimes that be before myself and my wife got married, in our courtship days, I remember when we write letters to ourselves. Every time we want to end up, I will, I will sign out and then I'll put my name. Oluka de Oshini. Most important personality for Jesus. We will abbreviate it. M I P F J. I can't forget it. And then when she wants to reply to, in fact, she started it all out. And I follow suit because it is scriptural. She was the first one to start that style. And I see it as a revelation. Because if you don't know who you are, the devil will change you to another person. If you don't know who you are, you will be a slave where you are supposed to command. Christianity of many people is filled with fear and doubt because they don't know who they are. At least in the sight of God, they are not aware of who they are. So they are not walking in the light of who they are. So when, when my wife replies, she will also put her name, sign out, and said, Ade Yemi, Ade Bobola, most important personality for Jesus. Even if you didn't go to school, the day you become born again, you are most important personality for Jesus. You are one property that God has on the earth. Remove the church on this earth. This earth becomes hopeless. The church is the only investment of God on the earth. You are that church. I am that church. You are the only reason God's full wrath has not been unleashed upon this earth. We are the ones staying back the hand of God. Otherwise, God would have finished this earth. And that is why when rapture takes place, God takes his people out here. Then the church is, the world is hopeless. Then God is free to unleash his wrath. May you not be here at that time. May you not taste out of the wrath of heaven. I can hear your amen. It's a serious prayer. I want you to walk in the reality of who you are. Some people attach importance to building houses. If he has not built a house, even if they say you are important, they say, hey, you are deceiving me. I don't have anything. If he didn't go to school, if they told him you are important, he would say, hey, you are deceiving me. Me that I, I, I didn't go to school. Beloved, once you become a child of God, you are important. Somebody say, I'm important. You are important to God. The creator of heaven and earth. Beloved, men may not know you, but God knows you. And that is what matters. God knows you. God hears your voice. You talk to him and he listens to you. You are most important personality for Jesus. Did you hear what I'm saying now? That is the reason for the golden candlestick. That tells you the heart of God. That tells you how important you are to God. 
That tells you that God does not joke with his church. That tells you that God's people are the most important people on the earth. Just like gold is very important. Now, how many of you have seen original gold before? How many of you have seen raw gold before? You know, people don't joke with gold. Yes or no? People don't play around with it. It's always kept. Because it is precious, it can be stolen. Did you hear me? There are some people that they, they keep their gold in the bank. Because that is where it can have enough security. In fact, some people don't, don't, don't have their money in cash. They convert their money to gold. Because gold is very precious. Some of the things we see outside in the name of gold are not original gold though. Are you hearing me now? Some of the things we see outside are not original gold. When you see original gold, you will know that this is original. You are like that. You are precious. Tell somebody, I am precious. Say it again, I'm precious. Why are you allowing what people say about you to determine who you are? Why are you allowing what people say about you to determine your identity? Why are you not focusing your attention on what God has said about you and who God says you are? For me, it doesn't matter what people say about me. I'm not moved by them. I'm only moved by the word of God. I am golden. Tell somebody I'm golden. I am golden. I am golden in the world. I'm golden in the hand of God. I am golden by divine estimation. I am priceless. I am precious. Beloved, the church is a nation of God's people within the nation of the world. The church is a nation of God's people within the nation of the world. Beloved, the church as, a, as part of the church, you are first and foremost a member of the kingdom than a citizen of Nigeria. Did you hear that statement? You are first and foremost a member of the kingdom on the earth than you are a citizen of Nigeria. So your first allegiance, your primary loyalty must be to the kingdom. We are a nation of God's people among the nations of the earth. In this kingdom, we have our own laws. We have our own constitution. That's why the world cannot understand us. Because we are not running the same law. We are not running the same constitution. We have our own culture. That's why the people of the world cannot understand our culture. In this kingdom, if we want to be the leader, we will serve everybody. In the world, if they want to be the leader, they will enslave everybody. In this kingdom, we love even our enemies. In the world, they hate their friends even. You see, we are not the same. That's why the Bible says, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. For everything in the world is lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. It does not belong to the Father. We are not part of this world. We have our own culture. The Bible is our constitution. Jesus is our head. Are you hearing me now? Our citizenship is in heaven. So anytime the laws of Nigeria is against the laws of the kingdom, we will disobey the law of Nigeria to obey the law of the kingdom. Did you hear me? Your allegiance, first and foremost, must be to the kingdom, not to Nigeria. Did you get that? Very, very important. So we don't look at Nigeria based on what is happening in Nigeria. We look at Nigeria in the lens of the culture of our kingdom. So there are many things that is happening in Nigeria that is strange to our kingdom. Beloved, 
Beloved, you are precious. Tell somebody I'm precious. Tell somebody I'm priceless. Number four. Look at Revelation chapter 1 verse 13. And in the midst of the church, you, had, you saw what I'm reading? And in the midst of what? Of the church. You know, there, what you have there is in the midst of the seven candlesticks. And since the seven candlesticks is the seven churches, so it means in the midst of the church, one like the Son of Man. So you see Jesus Christ in the midst of this church. John saw Christ standing in the midst of the seven candlesticks. That means that Christ, the head of the church, is in the midst of the churches. Christ, the head of the church, is in the midst of the churches. So, if Christ is not in the midst of the church, you will not refer to that as the church. Because the originality of the church is a, pres is a function of the presence of Christ in the middle. Did you hear what I'm saying now? How do you know a true church? Find out if the presence of Christ is there. That's the, that's the lesson the Holy Ghost is teaching us. You don't know a true church by the name they bear. We have churches today with fantastic names. But the presence of Christ is not there. We have churches today with fantastic architectural masterpiece. But the presence of Christ is not there. We have churches today that are located in the high bro of town. That the rich, the big people attend there. In the GRAs, but the presence of Christ is not there. So a church is not a church because of its building, because of its name, because of anything that is physical. A church is a church because Christ is in the midst of his church. The midst of the church is a place of control, is a place of significance, is a place of influence. Did you hear what I'm saying now? Christ, the head of the church, is in the midst of his church. Beloved, Christ is present where his redeemed people are gathered. Christ is present where his redeemed people are gathered. And wherever the redeemed people are gathered, and Christ is present there, that is the church. Nothing qualifies the church better than that. Christ is present where his redeemed people are gathered. You know, if the people gathering today are redeemed people, born again people, we would need to pray that Christ, come down, come down, come down. Ah, Jesus, come down, come down. It's not necessary. Because the gathering of the redeemed people automatically invites the presence of Christ. Did you hear me? The next time you go to church, find out if the presence of Christ is there. If it's not there, it's time to leave. Because if the presence of Christ is not there, you are wasting your time there. It is the presence of Christ that makes a church a church. And you must know the things to look for to know the presence of Christ is here. If you have the spirit of Christ, you'll be sensitive to the presence of Christ. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? I would rather attend a church in the middle of the forest built with local bamboos and palm fronds and have the presence of Christ than to attend a sophisticated cathedral in the center of town. And the presence of Christ is not there. Don't let your judgment be physical. Be spiritually sensitive. If you are not sensitive to the presence of Christ. You don't have the spirit of Christ. Did you hear what I say now? 
you must know where the presence of Christ is domiciled. Don't worship anywhere. Look out for the presence of Christ. You can travel many kilometers to worship. If that is how far you can go to get the presence of Christ. People say, what is he looking for? How can somebody be, how can somebody be moving, traveling too much distance away from his house to look for church? Are there no churches around? We are not looking for building. We are not looking for the gathering of men. We are looking for the gathering of the redeemed people. And we are looking for the presence of Christ. That is what makes us the church. Because Christ must be in the midst of his church. Christ must be in the midst of his church. Don't be present where Christ is absent. So, if the redeemed are gathered, they don't need to pray, Christ, come down, Christ, come down. He's already there. Look at Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. I read verse 20. I want everybody to go there. Matthew chapter 18. Verse 20. This is Christ talking here. For where two or three are gathered together in my name. I want you to underline in my name. Because the purpose of the gathering is important than the size of the gathering. The reason for gathering is important than the size of the gathering. People are looking for numbers. Christ is talking about why you gathered. It must be in his name. If he will be there. If it is out of his name, he cannot bless the gathering with his presence. So Jesus said, for where two or three, so as to let you know it's not about the numbers. Because humanly speaking, if you want to look at how do we rate a church, we say, well, at least there must be 50 people there before you can say it's a church. But thank God you are not Christ. Because that's not what Christ is looking for. Christ said, where? How many? Two or what? Or three? Now, if it is two or three today, people don't reckon with them. Yes or no? They say, how many are they there? They are not, they are not more than two or three. Are those people serious at all? Are those people serious? It is when people see Christ, they say, ah, that church is a serious church. That's the deception of the devil. Unfortunate. Many crowd and Jesus is not there. This is the scripture. Don't be carried away by physical standards. That's why people's Christianity is not thorough. God is looking for crowd. He's not going to stay where he will be recognized and tutored and discipled. He, is go he wants to stay in the crowd where he will be easily lost in the crowd. He wants to be in a place where he is an anonymous face. An anonymous face is an anonymous destiny. Are you hearing me now? Now, am I saying it's wrong for the church to be big in number? No. But let it fulfill the, qual the, the quality that can bring the presence of God down. Otherwise, the number is useless numbers. I would rather have two or three with the presence of Christ than to have 300,000 without the presence of Christ. What of you? Which one would you rather prefer? Two or three with the presence of Christ? Or 300,000 without the presence of Christ? Which one would you prefer? The Bible says here, for where two or three are gathered 
together in my name. Dear am I in the midst. Somebody say midst. Does it look like the same language in the book of Revelation? There am I in the midst of them. In faithfulness to his promise, Christ comes to fellowship with his own people. He did it either in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. Let me show you three scriptures. And then we're going to pray. Next week we're going to pick up from here. Now, look at this. Deuteronomy chapter 23. You know, Deuteronomy is uh, Old Testament. Are we still together? Are you blessed tonight at all? Deuteronomy chapter 23. I'm going to read verse 14. Every time you see Christ present in the midst of his people, Deuteronomy 23, verse 14. For the Lord thy God walketh where? In the midst. Did you see the word mist again? In the midst of thy camp. To do what? To deliver thee and to give up thy enemies before thee. Therefore, this is the prize for his presence. If we want to sustain and retain his presence. If you want Christ to be with you. Therefore, thy camp shall thy camp be holy. That he sees no unclean thing in thee. And turn away from thee. Did you see that? That is in the Old Testament. You know the, pre the children of Israel in the wilderness. They are the church in the wilderness. If, if God could give them his presence. Beloved, where two or three are gathered, the presence of Christ is there. Our fellowship is meaningful because of his presence. He comes to fellowship with us. To deliver us. To empower us. To teach us. To heal us. To answer our prayers. Next week, I'm going to tell you nine things that Christ is doing in the midst of his church. You will, you will never want to lose the presence of Christ. And you will never want to be in a church where the presence of Christ cannot be guaranteed. Because the presence of Christ is doing something. It's not in the midst of his church for fun. It's not in the midst of his church just for convention, is there doing certain things. So you see, in the wilderness, these are the people that were delivered from the slavery of Egypt. Egypt today is a type of the world. When you become born again, you are like a child of Israel delivered from Egypt. Are you with me now? That's the same thing. So as they are in the wilderness, the Bible says you don't have anything to fear. The wilderness can be dangerous, but the presence of God has taken out the fears. When people talk about the world, they say, hey, this world, dangerous, difficult, terrible. They qualify the world with all kinds of negative adjectives. But beloved, you have nothing to fear. Because the Lord thy God walketh among you. The presence of Jesus is in our midst. His presence has removed the fear. His presence has removed the danger. That's why David said, I was glad. When they say, let us come into the house of God. And this is the prize. To retain his presence. Thy camp must be holy. Somebody say, my camp. Now, your camp today, because, listen to me, your camp today is not a physical camp. Your camp includes your body, your soul, your spirit. Your body, your soul, your spirit. Your body, your soul, your spirit is your camp. It must be holy. 
Otherwise, you will lose the presence. How many churches are celebrating numbers, but they have lost the presence of God? I'm praying for you. May you not lose the presence of God. The woeful thing that can happen to a man is when he lost the presence of God. Samson said, I will go out like before and shake my body. The Bible said, he wished not that the Lord has departed from him. May that tragedy not be yours. May you not experience that tragedy. I don't want God to leave me. I don't believe you want God to leave you too. That's why you must pay the price to retain his presence. As a church, we must pay the price to retain the presence of God. Because if we gather and Christ is not here, we're wasting our time. We're wasting our time. Because when we gather and Christ is not there, God is not seeing the church. Even though people see us as church, if Christ is not there, God is not seeing the church. God is seeing other things. It's not the church that gather. It is the presence of Christ that makes the church church. Because for the church to be church, Christ must walk in the midst of his people. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Of course, you know 2 Corinthians is in the New Testament. Am I correct? So you see the same principle in the Old Testament, the same principle in the New Testament because it's the same God we are dealing with. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I read verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not what? The unclean thing. And I will receive you and will be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and daughter, saith the Lord Almighty. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. Open your Bible. Hebrews chapter 13. I read verse 8. And I want to pray that this verse 8 will be your reality. Or let's read from verse 5. Verse 5. Verse 5. Really. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. That's his promise to us. I want to pray for you, you will not lose the presence of Christ. I want to pray for us as a church, we will not lose the presence of Christ. And where we have lost it tonight, let him return. Clear the mess out of your life. Clear the wrong thoughts. Present yourself holy so that his presence can return. Let's rise up tonight. Are you blessed? Is it worth your coming? Now, tonight we are going to pray. My light will not become darkness. My light will not become darkness. It is more of a decision than a prayer. You are part of the church. You are a candlestick. In that your family. You are a candlestick. You have two jobs. To show forth the light of the love of God. And the light of the word of God. And the Bible said, ye are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Therefore, let your light so shine among men that they will see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. Is your life giving glory to God? If your life is giving glory to God, you are shining as light. But if your life is not bringing glory to God, you are not a light. I want us to search ourselves tonight and be honest. 
Lord, help me. Everywhere I failed, have mercy upon me. As from today, Lord, my light will not become darkness. Men will know the light of God through me. My family will have access to the light through me. I will no more deny my status as the light of the world. I am the light of Christ in the world. Never again will I fail in this responsibility. Oh, open your mouth and begin to pray. Have mercy upon me, oh God. Everywhere I have not reflected the light of Christ. Have mercy upon me. God is looking at the example you are giving. What kind of life are you living? When people look at your life, what do they think about Christ? What do they think about God? Are you, are you failing in your assignment as the light of Christ? What are you radiating? What is moving or flowing out of your life? Lord, have mercy upon me tonight. Everywhere I have come short, have mercy upon me. How can you be in that school and the light of God is not shining in your life? How can you be in that office and the light of God is not shining through your life? How can you be in that community and the light of God is not shining in your life? Lord, help me today. I choose to shine as light. That through me, men will know the light of God. They will see the light of the love of God. They will see the light of the word of God. They will come to know God more. My light will shine brighter among men. They will see my good works and they will glorify my father in heaven. I will no longer be a stumbling block to the program of God on the earth. In the name of Jesus, my candlestick will not be removed. Give me oil in my lamp, O oh Lord. Keep it burning. And keep it burning till the Lord shall come. When people look at my life as from today, they will see Christ. Let that be your pursuit. Everywhere I failed in the past, Lord have mercy on me. Is a new day. Is a new day, Lord. Let's talk to the Lord tonight.